This is the Third World War by Compass Games. It's the designer signature edition. We're playing the combined game, which is effectively the full campaign, but we're probably going to extend it beyond the eight turns it normally plays out uh, to 12 turns. Depends how things go. Um, there's been a lot going on, as you would imagine, because this is effectively War Turn, turn 1, and... The thing we didn't do, we didn't do a, a Soviet surprise attack, um, but you still get a first turn surprise. It's not quite the same as a Soviet uh, surprise attack in the fact that NATO were able to do some um, forward movement, which they wouldn't be able to do in uh, the actual circumstances of a, a true surprise attack. Now... A lot of NATO units did get to move and they, they got a sufficient number of units in into position to uh, stop this from being a, a major problem. Things that happen with the surprise is um, NATO zones of control don't stretch across the Warsaw Pact boundary. You're not allowed to do deep strikes so you can't have a go at... Um, Things like runway cratering and actually uh, logistic strikes and things like that on the into the Warsaw Pack area because of the surprise. But you were allowed to do um, actual interdiction strikes in the NATO turn. So it started off with the Warsaw Pack giving us a, a, a right good pounding. Um, Managed to destroy four aircraft on, on the runway, but they, did, they only managed to get one crater. is isn't so good. They did lose quite a lot of fighters, mainly in air superiority and stuff like that, which is going to be bad for them. Um, mainly because of the superiority of the NATO fighters. One thing I did learn, I don't think either side put up enough air superiority. They, they both run out of cover. Uh, as you got further into the turn. So, Soviets managed to to make quite a bit of a breakthrough into um, Jutland um, area along the Danish border. They've, they've pretty much pushed this Danish unit back into Kiel, but you can still draw supply through that port. Um, Germans, they, they consolidated the line by falling back a bit here. Uh, so they've given up quite a bit of territory. But mm, the Russians, they give us a right good pounding along the, the front um, with attacks onto actual ground units itself, trying to disrupt them. Um which we couldn't reply to because of, because of the surprise element. But at the same time, um, it left a lot of NATO aircraft available to support the front. So, all right, we couldn't get at these gigantic Russian stacks at the start of the game. Um, and they were able to break through here and there. They had about three... Three, four different breakthroughs, but none of them were significant. They all got um, actually sort of, we actually fell back or, or managed to contain them. Um, they did a, they did a try three um, airborne assaults, only one of which was succeeded this one into uh, Frankfurt here, which has been a nightmare trying to get rid of it. We were pounding away at that position um, they overcame East Berlin really quickly in the first impulse but it did cost them it was an exchange so it did cost them a Polish unit and the Polish army is a bit fragile when it comes to, you can only take a certain number of losses before um, your morale starts to collapse so pretty much covers what's happened on the, on the central front. Um, 
the, the Allies are, are holding pretty well. Neither army's really in a bad way in any, any sense of the word. If we go up into the Scandinavian area, this one's, because there's severe storms in this area, it effectively grounded everything. That was what really what allowed the Russians to break through in Jutland, South Jutland, um, because the Allies weren't able to get any aircraft in there. Um, as I said, that the lot, there was a lot of Allied aircraft which had nothing to do really early on, so they, they, they were spending all their time supporting the ground units, but it could, that couldn't happen here. Um, so that's resulted in a bit of a mess in Jutland. Soviets have got quite a lot of units, well, say Soviets, Warsaw Pact, ready to do an invasion of Denmark, uh, an attack on Bornholm, but because of the severe storms, they couldn't do anything. Um, we go right up to the peninsula at the top. The Russians made quite a bit of progress, but severe storms means they could only move three hexes, well, say three hexes, three movement points. A turn um, the Norwegians had enough time to respond and they've got some NATO support units came in which have pretty much put them in a, a reasonable position because it's difficult to break through uh, along the Norwegian coast because it's very tight there uh, it's right along the Swedish border along this mountain range so you haven't got a lot of room to manoeuvre. Uh, what's a pact gain control of the uh, Norwegian sea but it didn't do them any good because of the terrible weather that's playing out here. Um, Sweden didn't activate they've got a limited um, What's that called? Limited preparation, I think it says on turn three, but that's nothing to to be interested in at the moment. Finland decided to go neutral. So not a huge amount of activity on the northern front. If we look at the uh, central area, Austria is neutral at this particular point in time. Now, it is going to go NATO on turn three. Now, if you're playing this game of pose, you wouldn't know that. And also, Yugoslav will go NATO if Austria is attacked. So, uh, I'm sort of role-playing this a bit. So, I've left some Warsaw Pact units around this area, keeping an eye on that border. In the, and on the basis, they don't know what's going to happen yeah i'm not committing huge amounts of forces to deal with uh, austria or yugoslavia we'll let that play out italy have moved units to the border the yugoslavia and the austrian border they're really just um defending the italian area there's not a lot they can do they've sent a few units up into the central area so it's fairly quiet um albania are neutral so they're going to keep out of it now the thing that was interesting for the uh, nato forces is greece has gone neutral they're not getting involved at all so that's sort of i don't know whether that's helping turkey or not probably not um because you've now got all the Bulgarian and Romanian forces with some Russian support pounding on the Turkish border, Turkish-Bulgarian border. The Turks weren't very well deployed and they got a bit of a pasting, but they were able to bring in a well, reasonable amount of reinforcements and things which, uh, which assured that area of the front up. A um, little bit of air activity, Russians had air superiority, but uh, it was fairly minimum. If we move down into the, the theatre that actually started it all, which is uh, Western Asia and Persian Gulf, Russian forces coming in from um, Turkmenistan over there, 
and in trans Caucasian, um, trans Caucasus military districts. I put the uh, the uh, NATO forces under a lot of pressure. They've done quite a lot of damage to the Turks. The Turks' morale's a bit flaky as well, mainly by clever use of air mobile units that the Turks were, were defending these mountain passes and the uh, Warsaw Pact were able to get air mobile forces behind them and uh, of course the Turks couldn't really retreat and they got, got chewed up badly. The sort of borders forming here you've got um, some loyalist Iranian army and some uh, Republican guard units on the border there. Soviets are sort of pressing in the middle. They captured uh, Tehran, which is basically totally overwhelmed it. Uh, there was about, there was no way that could be defended. Um, the NATO units did manage to strike at uh, Esfan here and capture it, but. Since then, because of all the Soviet activity that's beginning to take place in this area, they've fallen back onto this mountain range here, and they're probably going to end up trying to defend the uh, the Delta area. It was that Tigris Euphrates Delta? Other units are moving in Saudi, but they're not very strong. Syria's in a bit of a mess, Jordan's pressing it hard and there's some more Iraqi units coming in. Uh, so I can't see Syria lasting much longer before their morale cracks. But Iraq isn't going to do very well either. Um, it's taken a lot of losses uh, from its expeditionary force into Iran. Now it has got quite a lot of territorials it can bring in. They're not very strong, but um, it's not looking very good for NATO in the uh, the Gulf area, to be honest. And that's pretty much sums up what's been happening. Um, so as you can imagine, a turn takes a fairly long time to actually complete complete um, the only big thing I did wrong is that NATO aren't allowed to bring in their new units into the NATO first impulse but I brought in some central front uh, units in the NATO reserve impulse um, obviously that's given NATO an advantage but there's not a lot I can do about it at this particular moment. I can't. Ah, oh, one thing, yeah, I forgot the tactical advantage. But it's not that epic anyway. It gives you the ability to, to re-roll. And then the advantage goes to the other side. So uh, it would have only affected one particular combat. So I never used it. So the Soviets have still got it anyway. So it's something like in, in, in the bag there which they can use right can't say that there's much more to report um, as I've said it's a considering this is a monster it's got a very manageable rule set and the rule booklet covers everything it covers all the combined game so probably the last 10 pages of the main rules covers all the pol political stuff and the Persian Gulf etc a lot of that you won't be using if you're playing the scenarios it also covers the optional stuff like chemical and nuclear which mm, I might go chemical but I'm sort of role playing this as well I don't think either side really wants to go nuclear it just it's just stupid if you did, in my opinion, if you went nuclear on the battlefield, uh, you'd be slagging cities off within a few weeks. Okay, there we go.